Think of beauty is a joy forever. Who else can write such a beautiful line except John Keats? As Wordsworth is a priest of nature, similarly John Keats is a priest of beauty. He has written so many great books, great poems, and Ode on a Gracious Man is one of them. So today I would like to present uh, present on his poem Ode on a Gracious Man. This poem was written in May 1819 and published in January 1912. 1920. The ode is one of several great odes written during 1980s. One such ode. Odes are Ode on Aggression, Ode on Melancholy, Ode to Psyche, Ode on Indolence and many other. So first the question comes in our mind is that what is an Ode? So Ode it, word is itself of Greek, Greek origin means it is a short lyrical composition proper to be set or music. It is a lyrical poem characterized by sustained noble sentiments and appropriate dig dignity of style. But Keats says made, made few changes according to him. Past writers were adhering adhere to the strophe, anti-strophe and import. But Keats has developed his own type of odes. So why he has write, written an old form? The question comes to our mind is that he may write sonnets, he may write elegy, but why he has chosen the form of old? So answer is, in 1890, Keats has attempted to write sonnet. But he found that the form did not satisfy his purpose because the pattern of rhyme worked against the tone that he wanted to achieve. When he turned to the old form, he found that standard pindari form used by John Brighton was not adequate for the properly discussing the philosophy that he wanted to discuss. So he developed his new kind of form that we find in World War of Rational as well as all the or he has written during 1890s. So the question comes in your mind is that from where did he get inspiration? Before writing anything, we must have to get inspiration. So from where did the kid, kids get in, in, inspiration about this writing this word? So the inspiration of this word has been derived from a marble marble urn belonging to Lord Holland. And what is urn? You can see this image as well as a urn is a container especially large round on a stem which is used for decorative purpose as well as to hold a dead person's edges this word and word now technique and stru structure which technique he has used in his word this is the technique of, of the poem is ekphrasis means the poetic representation of painting or sculpture in words this technique is used by kids is called ekphrasis as well as structure or on a Gratian urn is organized into 10 line stanzas with beginning ABAB rhyme scheme and ending with the Miltonic set set. First and fifth stanzas CD CD, second stanza CD CD, and as well as fourth, third and fourth stanza CD CD. So I have also got this about the in Gujarati analysis. If you remember earlier, I have shared a audio of a video of Pakistani lady in which she also talks that how art is a beautiful medium to express ourselves. So similarly, when John Keats sees this urn in a British museum, at that time he gets inspiration about it. And in the second paragraph, it shows that Kaviya Purana Gritna Kudrati Drishyo Jivan Paddhatiyo Ritrivajo Prem Darshino Sabu Nehi Pranchaksh Kriyasi and in the last stanza it says that it is not a pessimistic poem like what to Nightingale but this poem is a Anandho Sanatan Throat Se Sondariyaj Satya Se E Vishar Vichar Ehi Kavina Atmani Ashwa Sanapya Se now the what now I will analyze the poem by one by one stanza. So what is in the first? The poet sees the earth which was been standing at its place for so many years, untarnished by weather, etc. He calls it a bride of quiet, a bride of quietness, foster child of silence and slow time and woodland historians. Just as a bride remains remains calm and quiet, maintaining, maintaining her beauty, as so the earth remains un undisturbed and untarnished for a long time. It is a foster child of silence and slow time. Since it is passing so slowly that it has not been able to destroy by the grandness of the earth. I have also line by line interpretation, but rather doing that, I would like to show a video.
In order on a Grecian urn, another one of the more famous poems by John Keats, we get a real sense, on the one hand, of John Keats' real ability to describe concrete images and ideas and personal experience. But we also get, I think, a real sense of John Keats' ironic humor. Here he's writing about an urn, looking at an urn, and all of its aspects. And, and notice that on the urn is this beautiful scene. Uh, people dancing, and uh, men, and gods, and maidens, and towns turning out for, for ceremonies. There's romance, and there's music, and wild ecstasy, he says. And all these, all these scenes, and notice he's turning the urn, walking around the urn, looking at all this, noticing this, and noticing that. That's gorgeous, beautiful, wow, look at that art. And he goes on to say, here, these melodies are, are, are sweet, right? even sweeter than our own, because they are part of the unheard melody. But there's an irony in that, of course. Because what does the unheard melody sound like? He suggests that they're, they're sweeter than our heard melody, because they, they never fade, they never die. And yet the irony is that we don't even know what this, that would sound like. He all goes on to suggest that the tree is are never going so what he says in the second stanza, her melodies are sweet, but those unheard are more sweeter. Why he says? Because when we heard something, it is a not we cannot think beyond our imagination. So because in her music there is no pla place for flight of imagination. So why in her music there is in unheard music our fancy gets a free place. Imagination gives us an exquisite richness and sweetness which her music cannot give. And uh, in next he says that it has a spiritual effect and not the physical effect. So it is a better than the unheard melody. Heard melody. To uh, are never going to sprout leaves, right? Any more than the youth is going to leave his song. And the trees are never going to be bare because autumn and fall never going to come, seasons will never change. The lovers are going to be held right at that moment of ecstasy right before the kiss. And they're never going to experience the fullness, consummation of kissing, but yet they're right held right at that moment. The irony is, of course, for a song to be real, it has to go through time, it has to be heard, it has to unfold over time. For trees to be really alive, they have to go through the seasons. For lovers to really experience what love is, they have to be able to grow old and die together. Keats knows all this. And he's being almost ironic in a, in a humorous and ironic kind of way here. He says, Forever wilt thou love, and she be fair. All art freezes beauty. It, 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 it kills it in a way. Sort of enhances it, shows us with a cloyed, a burning forehead, and a parching tongue. All of that joy and, and the like in our world eventually leaves us with a burning forehead, parched tongue, exhaustion, and so on and so forth. But in the urn, it's right at the moment before that actually takes place. So the, the, the characters in the urn never experience the fullness of love, or the pain of love, or the exhaustion afterwards. They're simply at that, that moment, right on the verge. And then he brings up that irony of death. Because when that city that he describes, he says, are you emptied of people, you will be forever emptied of life. You are emptied of your folk this morning on the scene for the pious thing you're doing, but no soul will ever return to you. You'll be a city that is perpetually desolate. And that's why, in the last stanza, when he talks about this pastoral scene, he describes it as a cold pastoral. Art itself gives living person beauty and truth are not the same, because beauty has to change and alter. And the truth is that we all of us have to move towards death. The urn, that's all it knows on earth and all it has to know. But we as humans need to know a great deal more suffering, loss, pain, and sorrow, in order that we actually do learn what real beauty is, and real truth, and real love are. So the, about the last line, beauty is truth and truth is beauty. 
you know on the earth and need to know on earth on this line various critics has given their interpretation for some critics it is an utterance of new testaments robert bridge says that those lines are not very distinguished for which it is an uneducated conclusion and ds lee calls it a serious stain on a beautiful poem so the last cm bora explains the theory of beauty is truth he says that there is another name truth is another name of ultimate reality truth is not discovered by reasoning of mind but by imagination imagination has a true insight into the true nature of things urn is a symbol of great beauty and sculpture so yeah, what is beautiful is truth and every truth is beautiful thing that is you know and need to know